All right, look, I think um, I'm, I, I'm very relieved we have such a small room um, so we can keep it nice and informal and, and on a first name basis. What I think I might do before we start is just quickly go around the room so everyone can introduce themselves and that'll be a bit more sort of conducive to having a, a free, free flowing discussion later. Um, I'm, I'll start uh, and let's sort of go, is that counterclockwise? So my name is Simon Lacey, I, I run um, digital trade and trade and geopolitics at the World Economic Forum. Before that I was teaching international trade at the University of Adelaide in South Australia and the less said about that the better. <laughs> Before that I was, um, I was working at Huawei Technologies in China, in Shenzhen, uh, in their trade team which started out a very sort of meat and potatoes uh, technical trade job doing things like anti-dumping and local content requirements and then after the Trump administration came in became a very political job uh, and I, I left a few years after that. But, um, but anyway, uh, great to have everyone here and then I'll, I'll let uh, the others introduce themselves. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Well, good morning everyone, I'm Stephen Scarlett from Trends Research and Advisory. I'm a scientific advisor, essentially leads policy, policy type work across the portfolio of trends activities which include uh, geoeconomics, some geopolitics, national um, policy type things, and events. I know a few of you here and the others, delighted to meet you, I'm sure it's going to be a great discussion. I'm Sophia Galanzapos, I'm a professor of environmental studies and public policy in New York University in Abu Dhabi. Um, and my work really uh, revolves around how the climate crisis is kind of the umbrella topic that's reshaping geopolitics across the world and I've written extensively on rare earths and critical minerals and I have, I'm evolving into different areas of focus but resource competition I think is uh, you know, one of the very strong mm. issues I work on. Mm. My name is Monica Rubiolo, I'm the head of trade promotion with the Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs and we are involved in a number of uh, activities at the policy but also operational technical level um, related to extractives, uh, including transparency issues, governance, and uh, development of sustainable value chains. So this is the interest to be here. Nice meeting you. Uh, my name is Frank Lemke. I'm from Germany. I'm a copywriter and a friend of Lado. So this is a big opportunity for me uh, just to join and to learn and uh, to have uh, uh, yeah and to participate. I've studied religion science and maybe I have uh, one uh, or another idea that I can share that is somewhat helpful and I enjoy deeply to be here. I'm Natalie Bernasconi, I'm the Executive Director of ISD Europe and uh, so we're hosting this, uh, this event here. Um, and uh, IISD, which you may not know, is uh, hosts the Secretariat for uh, the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining Metals minerals, <laughs> metals, and sustainable development. And we have over 80 member uh, countries in, in that alliance. Hi, I'm Rachel Thrasher. I'm a legal researcher at the Global Development Policy Center in Boston University. Um, I'm head of our trade policy research and interested in critical minerals. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Sarhat chubuk -Jodo. I'm a senior fellow in strategic studies at Trends Research and Advisory here in Abu Dhabi. And uh, I'm not an official participant, I'm just here to listen and learn from the group. But uh, yeah, great to meet all of you. Thank you very much for coming. And then Larry has perfect timing. Okay. <laughs> 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 right for and, 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 uh, <laughs>
two administrations ago. His EPA or? Uh, no, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. So all oil and gas development, save the money, and all offshore wind. Wow. I'm Matt Nicely with the law firm of Aiken Gump. Um, I'm a trade lawyer and I'm outside counsel to uh, Abby's uh, association. So you're getting the second round of drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Yasmina Swahir. I'm Senior Policy Advisor at the Forum on Trade, Environment and SDGs in Geneva. Uh, we, our own aim is to try to align as much as possible the multilateral trading system with the climate uh, uh, objectives and action. And uh, I'm leading of the, on the climate crisis program of, uh, of TESS. And yeah, I'm here to learn a little bit more on the critical minerals, which is, I think, a debate that is coming strongly on the ground in Geneva. My name is Raul Leal. I am Associate Professor for Rabdan Academy here in uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, before that, I was uh, Associate Professor in UCL for about 16 years in the Department of Space and Climate Physics. Um, I am academic, I'm head of systems engineering here at Razan, and uh, my interest is in, in general research. I'm, I'm, I'm working with uh, Dr. Vigod and Professor Matt, and uh, that, that's where my interest comes from. So we have a small cluster of Rabdanites here to support Leonard. Um, <coughs> I'm also from <coughs> Rabdan, my name is Ron Matthews, and prior to coming to Rabdan, I spent up to three decades at the Defence Academy in the UK with Cranfield University. Uh, my focus is on defence economics and within that I look at a more specific, perhaps murky topic of defence offset. And I have dabbled in research in the area of the relationship between defence and development. Um, so, over to Vlado. Thank you, Ron. And also, Ron and Raul are uh, colleagues that we work on papers together as well, including a paper that's com coming up on, on looking at the defense side of critical minerals. But I, I'm, I'm Vlado, and I'm an uh, uh, associate professor at Rabdan Academy. <coughs> My focus is on, on critical minerals, but really they're kind of like a convergence of various topics that I worked on in the past, including sustainability in mining, uh, including energy security, international relations, political economy. It's kind of all kind of coming together nicely with, crit with critical minerals. But yeah, look forward to sharing some of my insights. Well, thanks for that. And it's just a testimony to, or a testament to your likability, Vlado, that you've managed to <laughs> run up so many colleagues here this morning. I'm really impressed. I don't think I could do that at the, at the web. We, we have uh, a couple of people who arrived late, um, some, some people who are backbenching, so we've got Fernando, Brendan, and um, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not familiar, but maybe you guys could also introduce yourself, um, introduce yourself very quickly, yeah. My name is Meral, uh, I'm the Head of Economic Research in Congo Minerals and Metals Export. Uh, you're, you're part of the Istanbul Steel Lobby that's here this week. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, good morning. I'm Brendan Vickers. I'm with, from an organization called the Commonwealth. We're based in the UK. Um, my interest is particularly around Africa, critical minerals, and the energy transition, mm -hmm. where we have several projects. Hi, my name is Fernando Pirol. I work for the Advisory Center in WTO Law. We're lawyers for developing countries. Right, well, thanks, thanks everyone. There's a lot of expertise around the room, so what, I, what I'll try and do is we're going to do a sort of first round of, sort of um, prepared remarks, but then we'll, we can get into a more kind of free flowing discussion. I think that could be I think that could be useful. Just to frame the issue very quickly, so why are we here and why uh, am I organizing this panel? Um, Natalie Benasconi rightly identified in about 30 seconds that I'm not really somebody that's done a lot of work in critical minerals and it's not really part of my expertise. Uh, <laughs> um, it's just hard to fake it when you're in a room of experts. But, but when, when I um, joined the forum, it was really uh, to do digital trade and trade and geopolitics. And, and the, the digital trade sort of came along as a bit of an afterthought. And trade and geopolitics really does seem to be where there's a lot of interest from from our um, from our partners, uh, from our corporate partners in particular, and and also um, a lot of head scratching by by government. So when I came to the role, I thought I would focus more on sort of geopolitical or strategic competition in advanced technologies, which is definitely where I sort of came from 
um, from, from Huawei um, and from my time in China. Um, but as I, as I sort of delved into this topic, this, I, this, this concept of sort of critical minerals and um, competition for resources kept on coming up. And then I, I read um, one of Lado's papers and, and really became sort of convinced that uh, this is something that we, um, we need to focus on uh, also at, at, at the forum. And of course, we have a lot of mining companies at the forum as well who are very interested in, in engaging on this. And so I thought um, for the, the IISD event, this would be a really a, a nice panel to, to convene and, and bring some experts. And we're really lucky to have uh, Sophia, who um, is so modest, she didn't actually mention that she wrote the book on on this subject, uh, the, the first sort of attempt to kind of formulate some ideas about this. And, and then um, it was Vlado that recommended Stephen also coming uh, at this issue with a lot of expertise from trends. So I was very happy to, to be able to convene this panel. So for me, I think the, you know, I mean, the, the, the forum, if you look at what the forum does, um, besides um, organizing this incredibly ostentatious meeting uh, in Davos every year, um, what, what the forum uh, it, it likes to do to, to do is, is you know, be committed to improving the state of the world. And it's one of these organizations, it's a bit of a change management organization that likes to um, be at the forefront of sort of positive change. And, and so really I think the emphasis that I've taken to this subject is to emphasize um, or, or to focus on cooperation over, over confrontation. Um, and, and that's really the only way that we're, we're going to be able to sort of navigate these difficulties. Of course there are tensions and there are areas where where there's competition, um, but if we can manage this competition in a constructive way um, and avoid conflict, um, which is kind of what you guys specialise in at Rabdan, um, then we then you know we can we can all hope um, to, to have uh, a world for, for our children and grandchildren to grow up in. So I think I think um, having having lived in China, I'm, I'm sort of quite familiar with the, the Chinese perspective and and um, and. You know the, the Chinese are really praised for their sort of success in, in identifying this as a as a strategic uh, sector sort of decades ago, and I think what we heard from um, President von der Leyen, but also from um, President Macron at Davos, you know they were trying to roll back this notion of decoupling from China or um, you know China is the risk. They were saying it's not we don't it's not that we don't want to trade with China, but we just don't want to be over dependent on China, and I think that's really an important nuance to, to, to make um, because if you treat China like like the, the risk and if you treat China like the problem then China will definitely be the problem mm -hmm. um, whereas if you if you treat the the issue of over dependence uh, <coughs> as the problem and, and you know the very common sense idea that we need to diversify and we need to improve resilience then you're not singling out one country as the problem so much but you're trying to address a, a, a common uh, problem with uh, with with solutions. So for me, it was really about reframing the narrative. So let me just move now um, to to Sophia, um, and I'm 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 going to ask Sophia. You know, what has the world? Why has the world been so slow? So you know, one of the things I remember about your 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 book, Sophia, was you you said, look, it was back it was Hillary Clinton back in 2011, 2012, who who said, you know, this is a problem, uh, and now we're 2023, and we still haven't solved this problem. So. So why has the world been so slow to sort of learn and implement the lessons of overdependence? You know, is it a lack of political will? Do we just not have enough money for the investments? What, is there some other bottleneck? So, yeah, please share with us your thoughts on that. So I was actually thinking different things, but then I'm thinking of the audience. So I'm, try, I'm going to try to kind of tailor my answer around things that might be of interest. The first thing is, I think, Simon, first of all, Simon, your career itself, shows you that the world is large. <laughs> and it's not, you know, a Western-dominated world. Uh, there are now new bridges, new opportunities. The world has become much more globalized. And in fact, um, I guess what, to answer your question directly, one of the reasons, when I wrote this book in, back in the ancient, ancient century of 2018, uh, and I wrote about the 2010 rare earth crisis, I said, this is incredible. How is it that we have this uh, very clear dependency on one supplier and we've lived through the crisis and no one really did any, anything, for real? I mean, the EU had nation states write reports. America took 59,000 bills to Congress. Nothing ever happened. Uh, there was, uh, you know, a trilateral talks between uh, the, the U.S. And, and Japan and the EU. But there wasn't anything fundamentally changing in the notion 
of resource dependency. So some one of the reason is because nobody because because economics were trumping the geopolitics, and now we have the opposite. <laughs> so if there is a kind of a key takeaway, is that geopolitics trump economics. Economics have managed to frame themselves as this rational approach to managing world affairs. It's all about growth. It's all about opportunity, bringing people out of poverty into the middle class, creating wealth, the wealth of nations, all across the globe, uh, opportunity. But the reality is that everything is political. And if we, we use this as a dirty word, but it's absolutely true. Um, so I think that was one big realization. The re when I wrote the book, there was pushback. People were saying, oh, this is just a blip. You know, the market's going to correct itself because rare earth prices corrected themselves. You know, they took China to the WTO. It took five years. By the time they got the response, China had managed to clean up its domestic production, consolidate, uh, and really uh, take it to the next level, cut a lot of the illegal uh, exports or smuggling uh, of these uh, resources outside of China. So, num so the thing is, there was this idea that globalization and markets could fix everything. The second thing was that there was the elephant in the room that was China, but nobody really wanted to acknowledge that. They knew the world was changing. Everybody knew that China had arrived, but it wasn't until Trump pulled off the Band-Aid and said, oh, by the way, you're the problem, China. You're my enemy number one. I am focusing on you. And suddenly, and I've been writing this for years, and Americans usually don't like it, uh, which I'm saying that it was the United States of America that made China the partner that we cannot have a discussion without. Yeah. Had it not been for the United States to make them such a fundamental key power partner in this kind of ultra recognition, we may have been able to prolong <laughs> this, I guess, illusion <laughs> that uh, the world had not become so um, multilateral, might, might I say, or that there was another huge power uh, in the horizon that had to be reckoned with. Um, so that's, uh, I think that was uh, a huge issue. And the third big issue was that truly the world had not decided in 2018 that it was going to decarbonize the global economy in such a huge way. I mean, they were talking about it, they were talking around it, but remember, even in 2018, I mean, Europe was producing diesel cars. And now, you know, China had already evolved and was moving to electric. And here, the United States was, you know, in, living in, I don't know, the past century. And Europe was producing diesel, and China was moving forward. And the idea, though, that decarbonization was going to become the great industrial plan to Remember, the, the objective here is not, the reason why we're decarbonizing is supposedly to save the planet and reduce the emissions in the atmosphere to prevent the worst effects of the climate crisis. So we're saying, where can we cut emissions? Energy, electrification of transport, 30%. Food will go next. That's going to be the next panel. Uh, so the point is that this will I think it was re it's really imperative to recognize what has happened in such a short time. It sounds as if we've been at, in this discussion forever, but it really is very recent. And it didn't happen, the United States did not truly get on board until Biden was elected. When he made it, <coughs> he framed it as the big economic and industrial transition for the United States. So these are huge <coughs> changes, I think. Uh, I don't know if I can add more, stop me when you have to. Yeah, let's stop there because um, we're getting we're getting some really uh, good vibes from the group. So I might I might um, let Vlado and um, Stefan speak, and then we can we can open it up for a discussion. If you don't, don't mind. Can I just add yeah, one th sorry. last thing because I just I don't want to forget it. When I said that the United States made China, you know, the kind of power, uh, world power that it is today, I wanted and I would just want to speak to what Simon said that. You know, the European Union, and I've also written about this extensively, the European Union has never 
made China into a geopolitical rival. And I think I have always recommended in all of my writing that the United States learn something from the European Union that talks about de-risking, uh, having alternate supply chains. The United States is very much um, committed to this kind of bipolar narrative. It's a very different kind of narrative than what the European Union uh, has always projected. Maybe because it really isn't a superpower. But the reality is it's much more civilian. The, the, the rhetoric is not as securitized. It's always about people and the economy, but not in the same way. If you look at everything, even in the climate negotiations, the European Union has always had a different level uh, and a different kind of rhetoric. It believes in a multilateral world. It believes in, fine, if anything, the European Union is going to make everybody standardize. It's using its regulatory power to ad nauseum <coughs> and will kill everybody through ultra-regulation, but it keeps the conversation going. So it's a very, di I just wanted to point out, it's a very different narrative. Okay, great, thank you. Lots to get into there. I actually did write that down, that it was the United States that made China the partner that we couldn't do without. I think that's a really interesting point that we can, we can talk about more later. Um, uh, Vlado, so, um, you know, the, the more we talked about this over, over different calls, the more I realised this is something that you also got into many, many years ago, over a decade and a half, you've been sort of following this sector, and, and, and so you can really give us some historical context on, you know, what's changed over the last 10 to 15 years in terms of how governments have approached the issue of critical minerals. I mean, we've had this sort of wake-up call and, and some more sort of navel-gazing and some thinking about this. Are we getting better and more informed policy making now thanks to this or are governments still making the wrong choices? Thank you, Simon. Um, so I'll just put on my timer for 10 minutes, right? Yeah, around, okay, around, around, around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, you know where I'm going because I could talk about this for three hours. Um, all right. Uh, well, great to be here, uh, this esteemed audience, and I'll share some of my thoughts on this and uh, hopefully answer the question as well to the best of my capacity. So we're looking at the last decade, and, and I, the way I'm going to structure this talk is, is to uh, around the concept of um, around several concepts. First, I'm going to uh, set it around uh, the, the, the policy trilemma, which I have studied and looked at, uh, looked at extensively in the, in the kind of energy policy space in the past. But with critical minerals becoming um, very trendy, uh, I think it applies very much in, in, in this space as well. So we've got the trilemma of security, of affordability or equity of, in access, and sustainability. So governments, policymakers need to balance these dimensions and and pressures on three sides, and and, and oftentimes um, are, are difficult, very difficult trade-offs are involved, and there's also difficult, very uh, uh, numerous tensions between these uh, different dimensions and even within them. And I will give some examples in in a few minutes. In addition to this, a state, there is also that question, I think, uh, uh, that's always been there, in the, in the, at least in the academic and policy literature, is what is the, is the correct or the, the most appropriate level of state intervention in these markets to, to achieve, I guess, if you like, to meet the trilemma, to make uh, a security of supply of critical minerals um, uh, satisfied to make access uh, affordable to the greatest number of people, industries, and so on, but also make the supply sustainable. And, and just by me talking about it, you're probably already coming up with certain ways in which these different policy uh, dimensions are in tension with one another. But um, what I'm going to do now is just talk about certain trends, certain tensions, uh, and certain trade-offs, and then finally finish off with some solutions. And happy to kind of talk about this in more detail when we move on. Uh, so the last 10 years, we've had some major shifts. Like firstly, digitalization uh, of the economy. We've also had this so-called hyper-competition between the United States and China. So a zero-sum competition, yet we live in a very interconnected world like never before. So globalization has not gone away, it's just changed in its kind of character. And in recent years, we've had this kind of push towards resource nationalism and countries becoming more kind of wanting to control these 
get involved in these uh, uh, markets, particularly with energy and critical minerals. So the, uh, the kind of a result of this has been a uh, push by several countries to diversify, particularly Western countries away from China. Again, nothing new. This has happened. History kind of repeats in a way with energy security. No one wrote about energy security before the mid-70s, and then the oil, oil crisis happened, and everyone became interested, and everyone wanted to diversify away from certain suppliers or diversify into other energy sources. So we can see this kind of happening now with critical minerals as well. Um, but we see some, because of these changing trends, and particularly changing geopolitical shifts, we've got, for example, uh, U.S. and U.S. interest in other parts of the world dramatically shifting over the past decade. Ten years ago, we had a United States that was still quite reliant on imports of fossil fuels, where this kind of decarbonization wasn't that much a thing. And now we have a total shift. We have the U.S. that effectively is, doesn't have much strategic interest in this region, in the Middle East, or in Europe, notwithstanding all these legacy security deals that it has with NATO, so on and so forth. Of much more interest are regions rich in critical minerals, for whatever reason triple use of these critical minerals. It's not just energy transition, it's also digitalization, and it's also defense. And as often, these are very much connected. And therefore, I think on a geopolitical map, particularly from the US perspective, countries like Australia, Philippines, Indonesia, Sub-Saharan African region, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Canada, uh, and, and Greenland are, are, are of particular interest because of their potential of these countries to provide supplies of critical minerals um, and particularly diversify away from China. So these are becoming, on a, on a new geopolitical map, at least from the U.S. perspective, which is still, I, I think, the dominant power globally, are, are becoming very important. What I'm going to say next is uh, I'll look into some of the some of the tensions that exist between those three dimensions, if you like. So, security versus uh, cost, for example. Some of you may recall, I don't know, 10 years ago, Poland decided to build a, an LNG terminal in Zwinjowska near the German border up in the north. Everyone was going, oh, why are they doing that? That's so, so expensive. They have cheap gas coming by pipeline from Russia. The cost of energy security. The cost of this is like typical tension. So you're going to pay for your security, pay a premium, or bring in more expensive uh, uh, LNG gas from the United States. Uh, uh, but so it's going to cost you, but you're going to have energy security. And this this kind of investment by Poland is is very very uh, important when you look at it from present day perspective of of uh, of, of what's happened with uh, Russia. So, so, so this is just a, one example, but you have other examples where you have uh, within, say, sustainability, for example, you have, on one hand, uh, fossil fuels, us trying to shift away from fossil fuels, but fossil fuels are still at about 80% of global supply, notwithstanding 28 rounds of COP. It's not gone anywhere. <laughs> and on the other hand, we have this push to this green transition, um, and I see forecasts, you know, by the International Energy Agency that we need 40 or 50 times as much lithium by 2050. I really, I don't know whether these people ever visited a lithium mine before. I mean, there's all sorts of issues around that and mining lithium, uh, getting a lithium mine going, and at the same time keeping to top or best practice environment, environmental and social and governance standards. So then we have, so, so I don't really quite know how, how, how these uh, forecasts are going to be met because there's simply not enough out there if we're going to produce it according to, to leading practice standards in, environmentally and socially. So we've got like two bad options, like we've got fossil fuels on one hand that are destroying the atmosphere and we've got overmining that is going to dig up the earth and I don't think it's like Sophie's choice, right? It's like we're, we're, uh, 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 one option is bad, the other one is just as bad. So my, my solution to this is that, or my suggested solution to this is that we do need some sort of disruptive sustainability technologies to take us out of this because I don't see either of those two kind of policy trajectories uh, going in, in the way that, that we, we, we need to. 
So critical minerals, in a way, are a bit of a microcosm here. They bring together energy security, energy transition, defense, geopolitics, digitalization. They, they, they affect everything. And you can see how countries, and particularly we had like over the past five or so years, about 30 countries publish their uh, critical mineral strategies. I remember 10, 15 years ago, the same was happening with energy security strategies, right? They were popping out everywhere. And now it's critical mineral strategies. And you put some of those, say China, US, Europe, EU, uh, you put them in three circles, and there'll be some overlap, right? There's some overlap, but whatever is identified as critical, it will vary from country to country. Mm. And, and you know, whether countries need to have these, and I remember having a conversation with the Turkish colleague the, uh, the other day, uh, need these strategies published. I don't know what is the utility. I mean, are you giving, you playing your cards by saying, you know, what is critical to you? You know, why should you be saying that? I mean, you're effectively playing your cards. But it's a good exercise for government, for, for key stakeholders, and this is going to involve people from departments of defense, um, any kind of energy departments, mining departments, getting together in the same room and bringing in expertise from different kind of silos normally to talk about what is actually important. It's almost like a whole of government approach and a whole of, whole of uh, society approach to identifying which minerals are, are actually critical. Uh, an example of this was we had a national defense industrial strategy in the U.S. published recently. It really, really brought up uh, the importance of these supply chains of critical minerals like, like no, nothing before it. So you really see how at least in the U.S. context, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and the U.S. Geological Survey kind of coming together mm -hmm. and needing to work out how to approach this stuff. I'll finish off with saying um, one more thing. Geopolitical trend, again, when in Australia, U.K., and the U.S. Uh, started AUKUS, a deal about submarines, someone told me, and I was based at the Australian War College then, uh, that this deal is about a lot more than just nuclear submarines. And now it's becoming obvious how and why. You have the U.S. De Defense Production Act of 1950 being changed, really, to allow production of critical minerals and processing and so on to be regarded as domestic for the U.S. So effectively, U.K. and Australia, in addition to Canada, becoming almost like domestic uh, players within this. So we got this concept of French shoring, uh, that is kind of very much connected to that and the mineral security partnership that US, UK, <coughs> Australia, EU are all kind of connected to that also pushes for leading practice environmental, social and governance standards. So we almost have this kind of bifurcation of, of the geopolitical trading blocks on one side, US and its allies, and on the other side, China and its friends and allies that are kind of emerging. But I don't know whether this is got leading to a, a sustainable long-term solution for, for the world. And I think we need global solutions to global problems rather than geopolitical trading blocks as a solution to global problems. It's not going to happen. But I think I'll stop there. I said, I said a lot and I went a bit over time, but I'm happy to expand on this further. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Nathalie. Um, yeah, no, I think we'll have 15 to 20 minutes for a sort of uh, open discussion, so we'll have plenty of time to, to get into these. So thanks for that. Um, great. Stefan, let's turn to you now. So um, I remember you, you came to Davos with quite a delegation of, of colleagues from Trends, and you were very much sort of interested in talking to some of our colleagues in the climate space. Uh, and so the, the question I wanted to ask you was, you know, uh, some, to map out some of the linkages between decarbonisation efforts and the, the new policy responses to securing critical minerals and, and, you know, tell us, I mean, help us join the dots between these two areas, but also tell us whether um, this new sort of policy convergence is grounds for optimism or, or pessimism, yeah, or somewhere in between. Right. Well, thanks, Simon. Thanks also for convening this panel. The, the views that, that I've heard have been very, very enriching so far. The, I think I'll start where, where my good friend Vlado left off, um, decarbonisation. A global problem requires a global solution. It's obvious. It's not just the, the ghost of COP, which we remember very well. We haven't forgotten. We continue to keep up the momentum here in the UAE and in our think tanks. But within the, the context of this global problem, um, decarbonization, we see a very strong tension emerging 
with the national interest that my, my co-panelists have already mentioned. And basically, in three areas, we're seeing this in the area of economics, not only decarbonization in the traditional sense of power production and substituting fossil fuels with renewable energy, which has a long way to go, as Vlada mentioned, but also in relation to the broader climate economy, which means electrification of basically everything, the, the industry, hydrogen, heat processes, and so on, maritime sectors, aviation sectors, and, and, and all the others. So the scope is incredibly broad. And you know, we might say decarbonization. Carbon's everywhere in the atmosphere, so it has to be you know, decarbonized by everybody equally in, in theory. But the issue that we're seeing emerge, and Sophia, you mentioned this, is that these new economic growth centers are so attractive as the future engines of um, growth to all, to all the economies. <coughs> and we've seen very strong policy emerge, in legislation, the US IRA, the Europeans with the Green Deal, the Japanese are very active on this, also China, of course, to establish what we see as a technology leadership within these respective areas and to invest and promote their private sectors rightly and to try to establish some kind of an international technology leader and economic leadership um, within these sectors. Now, critical minerals, of course, come into this because, Lado, as you said, they're used everywhere, not just in wind turbines and solar sort of power panels, but also in digital infrastructure, supercomputing, quantum computing. AI is largely reliant on these, on these minerals, um, which is why when you hear semiconductor wars, that's really what it's, it's a, it's a um, scenario of outright competition <coughs> already. The second area in which there is a, a tension between this global idea and national interests is the, of course, energy. Now, this is something that we're used to talking about. You know, I've come from the oil markets myself, and we know that energy, international energy relations are always politicized and always subject to geopolitical pressures. Daniel Jurgen, the chairman of IHS Market, recently said, and I'm sure that many of you know this quote, or I'll repeat it, that we're moving from the era of big oil to big shovels. Mining associates will know. So that is, it's, it, it, it gives the idea that critical minerals will be subject to capture by geopolitical forces. They are to a large degree already. But when we think about the traditional energy supply chain, so hydrocarbons, it's very simple. You know, you extract oil from the ground. It's in some unstable parts of the world, but the system works. And it's traded. It arrives in super tankers or in LNG ships for gas. It goes into a refinery. You, know, you get your product, your jet, your diesel, petrol, whatever. It's a simple thing. The, the ways of managing the energy supply chain are mature. Now, in the critical mineral supply chain, it's much more complicated, partly for the reasons of breadth that, that, that you mentioned. There are so many. And partly because the process itself is more complicated. The extraction, processing, often in a different country, refining. Um, and there, there are several steps in, the, in that process. It's very, very complicated. 17 or 20 rare earth elements, many critical minerals subject to geopolitical competition. So it's going to be far more complex, far broader in scope, far more complex. And we see uh, geopolitical forces more or less already aligned. And, uh, and we think that, that uh, on a think tank level, we look at this quite a lot, and we think that the, the future is going to be um, quite complicated in that regard. The third area is, of course, strategic. And we are seeing this. You mentioned that you, you touched on this, the, the DOD in the US now being directed by executive order to look at um, something which is not classically defense-oriented, but large capacity batteries specifically. So they'll be looking at the technology side. They're probably also looking at the cobalt, lithium, um, fluorine, fluoride, and, and so on, which are used in these large capacity batteries. So at that end of the spectrum, when we start to talk about national defense, national security, uh, you know, clearly there is little scope for, for multilateralism, and countries tend to tend to uh, focus on the national interest. So these three tensions um, are emerging quite clearly. 
On the policy level, Simon, what we've seen um, are, is limited multilateralism, if we contrast that with the global scope of, <coughs> of decarbonization. We've seen the MSP, it's great, 30 to 50 countries, some other states are not joining. It's very much um, a Western alliance. And so again, that's a, that's a tension with a, um, a global objective. And critical minerals is an area in which the global south being geographically the home of uh, a large share of global critical minerals, you know, would have some, um, you know, some, uh, some, some say not only in the discourse, but also in the, in the subsequent industry. We've seen some bilateral efforts in the, by, uh, by um, on a, again, the U.S. leading those efforts with Japan, with Europe, uh, the CMAs, you know what I'm talking about. Um, again, great, very bilateral, and by, by design, not a global response. Europe is also looking at this and have, and have uh, almost immediately run into the problems of regulation that you mentioned. Uh, because they discovered that uh, this is <laughs> there's, there's local opposition to mining and also recycling in some cases, so that isn't isn't working very effectively. So, in my view, Simon, none of none of what we're seeing is is very positive as a as a solution <coughs> on on a global level. Now, in relation to national interest, they're perfectly legitimate. Who wouldn't want to be the leader in the technology, uh, whichever technology area, wind turbines, everything. It, this is obvious. Uh, major nations have always done this. But with regard to you know, 70 or 80 percent of the spectrum, I think that there's a lot of space to, um, to multilateralize that issue. Now, you asked about optimism and pessimism, so I've sounded pessimistic. The glass half full or half empty. Well, That's but, but, in re but in reality, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic. In reality, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Because, as, as my co-panelists have mentioned, we're at the beginning of something. It's the beginning of a discourse. And so that is always an interesting opportunity to shape the course of, of the river or the stream at its head. Um, I think that the, the global south uh, needs to be brought into a, a meaningful consideration and on a discourse level, and that the academy, um, should study and produce more knowledge on critical minerals, also the practicalities, because we just see critical minerals, rare earth elements. So to specifically say what they're for, where they're used, what they're used for to inform public opinion. <coughs> the scope of policy I do, should proceed beyond security and beyond resilience, which is very much a legacy of the last three hellish years from that point of view, with the pandemic, with the Ukraine, it sensitized uh, certainly the business community and policymakers to try to establish more resilient supply chains. So I think that that, you know, not, that needs to be broadened now. It's, uh, I'm not saying it's an overreaction. And the hard alliances that we've seen are structurally very inflexible for the future, surely. I agree with you, Vlado, that you know critical minerals, and you know you send them to me and nobody else, and then I. Just... So clearly, in, in an evolving scenario, that is very inflexible. You know, history shows this: that initial bilateral structures, as the, the space develops, can can change because technologies change. And there's also an issue of substitution, and so on. Um, to wrap up, the. Well, I'll also offer some solutions, same time perspective solutions. The, there's a need for a global convener. We don't, we don't see a global convener. I mean, the Simon, you're at the WF, you're kicking off some very interesting um, work streams. Maybe you'll be the global convener. It would be a, a worthwhile effort. We don't see that. Where's the global convener? You know, we've seen this with climate diplomacy. We haven't seen anything with critical minerals. Um, and my last point, I already touched on it, the importance of knowledge production from the academy, from think tanks in a, in a lesser and more approximate manner, but nonetheless important to inform the public discourse, to inform industry research, another major um, 
uh, source of knowledge production. So that, those are the, the, the two forces which I think will, will, um, will develop the area, and policy hopefully will follow. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. That's, um, that's right. Did you want to add something really quickly? Or, okay. No, I just want to respond to two or three things that I think are important for the conversation. Okay, well, well look, let, me, let me open it up first. Um, I, I really wanted to sort of hear some comments or questions from the floor. Um, and then, you know, having the private sector here, I hate to put you guys on the spot, but it's always great to hear the, the views of the private sector because they don't always show up at these sort of events. So not, not to put you on the spot, but if you do have something you'd like to share, we'd really love to hear it. And then, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually pass to you first, Sophia, and let you um, respond, and then I'll open, open the floor. So thank you. So I, I, I want to point out a couple of things. In terms of a convener, I mean, I wrote a paper with a bunch of people that, that I worked with on my latest volume on this issue, and we had suggested IRENA. So I think that IRENA could be uh, a fantastic convener because it's a new institution, it's much more global, it's not so Western-centric, it's location, location, it doesn't have all the baggage, and everybody sort of participates in that right now. So it could be um, an interesting solution. It's not the International Energy Agency, which is a product of, you know, previous dominant world order. So that's the one thing I want to say. The second thing is, I'm actually want two things. The first thing is that, um, I don't know if we're in the beginning of this discourse or at the end, at the beginning of a new discourse. I actually think, and maybe that is interesting for the industry, for people in the industry. I think there's going to be pushback now on this whole plan. And I'll tell you why. Because, uh, and I find this hard for myself as well, because we're finding that this kind of rate of decarbonization has so many other problems. We keep seeing literature now, we don't have enough materials. We're going to rape and pillage the rest of the earth. We're taking the shovel. I mean, Jurgen, who's the fossil fuel spokesman, you know, is again finding a reason why we shouldn't transition. Um, so here we are, and and I think I think taxpayers are going to get start to get angry now, because the it for many people, and I'm and I'm I always feel as if I'm I'm listening, I'm feeling a trend coming. Um, I think there's going to be a push because there's too much uh, government investment in this. Um, and forget the United States. I, I don't want, I'm not speaking ill of the United States, but it has a very different uh, perspective. So this whole DOD thing has to do with the way that the United States can invest federal uh, money into a transition. Uh, it's very securitized. The DOD is the, whenever you need to do something, it has to be the DOD, because if it's national defense, nobody can, I mean, they cannot agree on anything except on DOD stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's always the DOD has been at the forefront of climate research, now of renewable energy. The people who even managed to convince some people in the United States who were objecting to, to renewables were former uh, people in the defense industry who said, we've used this technology that saved our soldiers. You know, let's make this transition happen. So America is a very different case, and I don't think we should collapse the various kinds of uh, competencies and ways that, that countries do business. The EU is not trying to build its defense. It's not using the defense industry as a reason to have a critical material policy. It's saying, we want to sell cars, we want to have renewables, we want energy inde independence, or in any event, some kind of autonomy. We saw what happened to us already. So I definitely think that we need to decouple because we're being swallowed in. And, and I'm telling you, I'm wondering about the beginning or end of the discourse, and I want us to be careful. Because what equation, what equation are we trying to solve? So far, everything we're doing is additive. No one's bringing to the table energy efficiency. I mean, we say it as sort of a refrain to a song. But everyone, all the projections are more people, more energy, more growth. Therefore, we're never going to get rid of fossil fuels. And we're never going to be able to do as much renewable as we'd like in order to get rid of fossil fuels. So we're stuck in this thing. And I think that this, there's a lot of political tension that's going to come out of this. And for the industry people, I would be wary as to where public opinion is going because so much of this transition is being subsidized by taxpayer money. 
Okay. Very the end. Great. Okay, so let me open it up. Um, is anyone, would anyone like to interject? Yeah, Matthew? Matt? So going back, Sophia, to something you said early on, mm. that the United States essentially created uh, China <laughs> as we know it today. When you say that, do you mean through the existence of policy or the absence of policy? Mm. In other words, did it, is it through economics, really, because of free trade? Or is it through a particular policy you have in mind? I mean, letting them into the WTO, I guess you could say. You know, I mean, there's so much backlash now. Now it's a shoulda, woulda, coulda. Right. Uh, we thought we were putting them into the WTO and they would become a democracy. I mean, honestly, anybody who thought that must have been, you know. We all thought that. <laughs> we were all idiots. Then so. we're all <laughs> not studying history. I don't know. Um, I I think, look, markets need to keep growing. China's entering the WTO did everybody a service, or rather, this economic model that we have. I don't. I wouldn't go back there, and I don't think. I think what what really made a difference. I think China had a very nice way of biding its time, of just focusing on its domestic policy. Everybody was kind of lulled. Um, the Soviet Union had collapsed. It was a series of, of events that had happened simultaneously. Um, and, I, and I also think that um, it's more this hysteria of, wait a minute, China now is an economic power. China has arrived. I mean, part of China's pushback to the West I mean, inevitably, everybody wants to have a seat at the table. The United States became the United States because they couldn't influence, you, you know, the British policy. They were, you know, being used as, uh, you know, a, adjacent markets and regulated from uh, across the sea. I mean, I think that, you know, China would have inevitably wanted a seat at the table and it wants to have a voice. I mean, that's natural. But I think it's the hysteria by which uh, the United States went from, uh, you know, the, it started with a pivot, it turned into containment, and the 2008 global financial crisis really triggered China. Two things triggered China. The collapse of the Soviet Union, which was like, oh my God, this could happen to us. And 2008 was, oh my God, these guys that were depending to regulate the global economy are really botching up the job, and we've lost so much money. We need to have a say, which is when they started creating other financial institutions. I think we should just see this. I mean, obviously, my interests, personally, lie in the Western hemisphere, but we need to see how the world has changed and some of the mistakes that have been made so that we can understand what the future is going to look like. By being in this kind of denial, um, and picking points of history that actually I don't think made the problem is distracting. If I could just one quick follow up on, I'm sorry, but see, I, I think we sometimes, particularly in, in conversations like this and in, in, in events like this, we focus so much on what governments do mm. as opposed to what does the market do. Mm. And I think the market created China, right? In part because they were allowed into the WTO, because uh, because barriers fell to ch to trade with China, but in our in the industry that we're talking about while we're here, the solar industry, intense dependence on China mm -hmm. by the industry, not because of government policy, but by the industry choosing to do that trade and choosing to become, frankly, overly dependent on on one country. So that, so the question becomes, what do you do if that's the case? Is it you know, do you need more regulation? <laughs> Right? Or do you need less? I guess that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the question. So I would also not see this as a binary. I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. The market, you know, Nixon opened China. The markets found the China. The markets made China. But had the government not opened China, you'd still be looking at Taiwan. So this is a huge... So I want to say that the beginning of all end is what the governments decide, and then the private sector finds ways to really maximize on it, which is both fantastic. And then then you come back and say, OK, now now we got a problem. <laughs> uh, and so you know, there are some people who say that part of the problem is we need so much regulation because of bad design. And so the reality is now, 
Now it's going to be hard to re, uh, you know, to rejig. I mean, I think we've gone so far to this side of comp hyper competition um, that I'll, I mean, even I, who am totally optimistic and see the pro I've seen the problem so clearly, I think we're going to have to build alternate supply chains, and they're going to have to be complementary. But I still do not believe we should decouple from China. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, just all this conversation about China and and who made China, what it is. I I, I feel like we're forgetting a little bit about China's government, which also played a really huge role in making the decisions that they did in terms of building their solar industry. And I think someone mentioned that earlier about their decisions they made. Mm -hmm. um, so that that leads me to a question about the government, the role of governments in particular in developing countries, maybe that aren't some of these polarized powers. <laughs> um, and I wondered if, if any of you could speak to concerns that th those developing countries are having in terms of not wanting to repeat the problems of a resource curse that exp they experienced for the latter half of the 20th century, um, and like what what sort of policies might you recommend to them, or or have you seen that work well to avoid that problem, or and what per perhaps since we're here, what role for the WTO? I can answer I can answer that to a certain degree, but yeah, go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. Bonifat Mavanda is my name from Sector Economy in Germany. Um, I want to raise a question on uh, critical minerals and extractivism. The push for extractivism in the global south is happening in the context where some of the industrial countries can't, uh, are not using the potentials they have for uh, energy transition. A country like Germany can't use the whole potential in using solar and wind because citizens in Germany are opposed to that, to using the land there. And it's exactly the context in where we are speaking about critical minerals in the global south, more extractivism, and the, the, the whole notion of, of critical, what is critical and to whom? Mm -hmm. Because for some of the people in the global south, uh, Land and water mm -hmm. are critical, mm -hmm. not cobalt for the transition in the global north. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we do? Uh, I think that the world notion of transition assumes that uh, those who are having resources have to fit in the concept of, of those who don't have. <laughs> so um, my question is, what if a country like uh, DRC Congo, wh wh where I was born, producing right now more than 60% of the cobalt of the world? If this country will, uh, at the end, uh, will have a, a, a government, because right now we don't have a government there, a, a government which would say, say no cobalt from the DRC to the world, what then? Yeah, look, it's a very interesting point, and it, it actually, it raised the idea of, you know, this idea of critical minerals, critical, yes, but critical to who? I mean, lithium's critical to me because, you know, I'm addicted to my phone, and, and copper is important to me because I kind of like electricity. But, you know, there are there are other people that come at this, you know, from a totally different perspective, and I think that's very important. Just on your question very, very quickly, I, I, I was asked a similar question at a conference in Beijing last year, and, and I just, it was, I was reminded of something that... Um, uh, one of one of my colleagues at Walmart said, so the head, Sarah Thorne, the head of um, global government affairs for Walmart, and she was explaining, you know, why Walmart doesn't source a lot of things from Kenya or, or other markets in Africa, and, and really, you know, it, it uh, we, we've heard all of this before, and you know, this is nothing new, but really, you know, you you need sort of political stability, you need um, you know a, a regulatory <laughs> environment where where it, you can invest without, you know, too much risk, and you, you know, there's a bunch of sort of policy fixes that that um, governments need to address seriously in in order to be able to make themselves attractive to business. And again, this goes back to what Matt Nice was saying about you know, business, business drives all of this. You know, the very first book I read about China, I've read so much about China now, but the very first book I read was something called One Billion Customers by a guy called James McGregor, who's still around. He runs APCO's. Um, uh, Greater China practice, and he was the Reuters bureau chief back in the the um, 90s when uh, when China sort of tried to, I think, 
it was Xinhua that tried to capture all of the economic news reporting for itself um, and put Reuters out of business. And this was kind of like a, a time in the in the trenches for him. And he writes this great book about you know how he just documents how business came to to China in the course of sort of the 90s and and early 2000s. And it was it was very much the attractiveness of a new market. Now it's it's more it's about much more than a market. It's about you know China's ability to be a factory, but also China as a place to do sort of cutting e cutting edge research and R and D. I think China mints something like seventy percent of the world's PhDs now in chemistry and in a whole other fields. So a bunch of other fields. So if you wanna if you you know if you wanna be at the cutting edge of R and D, you've got to have some sort of presence in China as well. So it's about making yourself attractive uh, across different um, different avenues. Good. I, I might, we, I, Samiksha is telling me we need to leave a minute ago. Um, the next bunch of guys are coming in in half an hour, so I think, you know, we could do maybe another two or three minutes. But, um, <laughs> Sophia, anyone, anyone else? Because um, Sophia and I have all, all talked a lot, but if not, then... Sophia, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted, I think you, your questions about the um, extraction and uh, what's to be done with countries that uh, are in... I won't even call it the global south and developing nations. I think these are this is another huge area that we're not really confronting at all. So part of it is this is why we were writing about IRENA. We think that the developing nations need to have some kind. I don't want to call it a champion, but they need to have a space in which they can uh, produce their their own vision, their own policies. I will say that. I think China again by doing the BRI or actually investing in Africa really. On the one hand, there's all this talk about uh, debt, which a lot of it is debunked as well. But the idea is that it gave, let's say, Africa, African nations, some agency, and they were not beholden on one side. They, they had a little bit more of a flexibility to negotiate. Uh, so I think the African Union has come up with certain uh, ideas and policies on, on how to develop these sectors. I definitely think that this you know, we must not forget that in this crisis of crises, we've been saying that we want equity and inclusion. And we cannot use these countries as holes in the ground from which to just take material and go. But I also totally sympathize with this uh, notion that you're saying. And we have to decide what do we, the countries may be banding together to have bigger, more power, but they have to decide, is my water more important than producing lithium mm -hmm. for the world markets. That is a huge dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't think we can solve this. There has no, to no, be... We need to solve this today. I <laughs> <laughs> can't even hint to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But Natalie, did you want to say something? Uh, no, uh, I do want to invite you all to come to the next annual General Assembly of the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining uh, Minerals, Metals uh, for, and Sustainable Development. Was, it came, it's one of the partnerships that came out of the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002. It was a partnership spearheaded by South Africa and Canada at the time, and it's been going on. It was managed by Canada since 2015. We've been managing the uh, the, the partnership, and and frankly, you know, we've been talking about mining there, bringing mining ministries together for all this time, and yes. Now it's a hype, like it just exploded. People who were not interested are now coming. And the last one was, of course, the last annual General Assembly about critical minerals. And every single mining ministry that went up from developing countries was saying, we will not just, you know, be there waiting for you um, and let you do what you want. We're going to want something. We want value addition mm -hmm. because we haven't had it in the past. So that's going to be a big thing. So when is the next yeah. meeting of this? Uh, it's it's in November. And where? It's always together with UNCTAD in um, in Geneva. We will be there. I'll be there. I live in. Not very far <laughs> for you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, look. I'll just thank everyone for coming. I really appreciate the the turnout. Um, we we were a bit worried that we might be talking to an empty room. That ended up not being the case. So we're very very happy. And I'd like to personally thank everyone for coming and. Um, yeah, we'll be we'll be outside to continue the conversation. Let's make sure set up for the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.